Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for what promises to be an interesting behind-the-scenes look at how the New York Botanical Garden is managed. My name is Debbie Parnon, and I'm the president of the Tree Conservancy of Darien. I've always liked the Greek proverb, at least that's what I think it is, a Greek proverb. Sometimes it, it comes across as, as an anonymous uh, comment, but a society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they will never sit in. I've always liked that because I think that that's what the Tree Conservancy is doing. We're planting a lot of trees that some of us may never see grow to maturity. And I think that that is really what um, the mission and focus of, of what we do environmentally is all about. Uh, the Tree Conservancy of Darien is dedicated to preserving, enhancing the treescape for Darien residents and visitors to enjoy and to leave a legacy for those to come. During the past three years, our stewards, with cooperation from the state and town administrators, have planted 50 trees on public property, most notably on the Exit 11 and Exit 13 traffic islands and on the railroad berm along Squab Lane. Through generous do donations, we are able to purchase good-sized trees, plant them, and provide water to get them established. Planting trees is only part of our mission. You can check out our website and like us on Facebook to get more information about what we do. We will be posting details about our third annual tree sale and photo co contest coming up in 2014. Thank you to our co-host, the Darien Library, for providing this wonderful venue, and the Darien Land Trust for their vision and efforts to preserve and protect our open space. Thank you very much. I'll be very, very quick. Um, I'm Shirley Nichols. I'm with the Darien Land Trust. And we are very, very happy to co-sponsor this lecture with uh, Todd Forrest today. And um, currently, I have some pictures of some of our trees. We now protect more than 200 acres in um, Darien. And we are always looking forward to your support. Thanks for coming. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Erin and I'm Head of Adult Programming here at Darien Library. I'm going to introduce our speaker this evening. But first I would just like to briefly mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make programs like these available to the community. Tonight's speaker oversees all aspects of the management and development of the New York Botanical Garden's landmark 250-acre site its glass houses and indoor and outdoor exhibitions, including the 50-acre Thane Family Forest, 50 gardens and plant collections, exhibitions in the End A. Hoft Conservatory, and outdoor art exhi exhibitions. He manages a staff of 50, sorry, a staff of 80, including managers, curators, gardeners, and community horticulturists. An advocate for historic trees, forests, urban landscapes, and public gardens, he has written many articles and interpretive materials. He joined the New York Botanical Garden in 1997 as an intern and research assistant in the science division before joining the horticulture staff as associate curator of woody plants in 1999. Previously, he worked at the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University. A graduate of Wesleyan, he has a Master of Forest Science degree from Yale University's School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Please join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Todd Forrest. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. I don't know, is it possible to turn the lights on so you can see the, um, oh, it's like magic. Oh, wow, <laughs> this is great. Um, OK, so wow, I never quite recognized myself when my, my little bio is read there. Um, suffice it to say that uh, I have the great good fortune of working at the New York Botanical Garden in the Bronx in New York City. I've, I've been there for more than 15 years. Um, and over that time, I've come uh, to really feel that it is one of the most important public landscapes in the whole world. Um, it really is an honor to work there. I have an incredible group of colleagues. It's an incredible landscape. Uh, it's in, in a, a period of kind of restoration um, like it hasn't seen in its entire 125-year history. Um, so it's great fun. Um, 
Who has not been to the New York Botanical Garden? Only a few of you. Um, well, there it is. Um, excuse me, if I grab my pointer. Um, it's in the northern Bronx, um, in the northern end of Bronx Park. It's 250 acres. It was established in 1891 by an act of the state legislature of New York, really to be um, America's version of the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. Um, those of you who have been to the garden have probably been to one of our many seasonal exhibitions in the Enid A. Happen Conservatory. Here's Monet's garden from last year. We have a chrysanthemum exhibition up right now that is absolutely unbelievable. It's up through this coming Sunday, so if you want to run down to see it, I would highly recommend it. Of course, you know um, the garden for its many classes. Uh, we have classes for everybody from preschoolers through PhDs, one of the largest continuing education programs of any institution in the world. It's an amazing place. It is the place to learn about anything that has to do with plants. Many people might not realize that the largest part of the garden is devoted to scientific research of plants around the world. Um, we have programs in floristic botany, which is the study of plants in any given region. Systematic botany, which is the study of the evolutionary relationship between plants, and even genomics and molecular systematics. Um, we have a cutting edge laboratory, again, 40 PhD students, uh, 40 PhDs, and uh, more than 100 support staff. The garden came uh, into being because of the vision of these two people, our founding director, Nathaniel Lord Britton, and his wife, Elizabeth Gertrude Knight Britton. Um, Nathaniel Britton was a professor of geology and botany at Columbia. Um, uh, Elizabeth Britton was a, an expert on mosses, a biologist, um, and an early conservationist, and we'll talk more about that later. But in 1888, the story goes, they went on their honeymoon to London and saw the Royal Botanic Garden Kew, and in the center of this picture is the Palm Dome at Kew, an institution devoted to the scientific study of plants and to public education around plants. And they thought immediately that New York and North America needed a similar institution. So they came back home and energized to create the institution that has become the New York Botanical Garden. At the same time, there was a great push in New York City to set aside open space, sounds familiar, um, at the edge of the expanding city. Um, and a man named John Mullaly, who was a muckraking journalist uh, in the middle of the 19th century, um, really galvanized public support for setting aside about 4,000 acres of open space in what is now the Bronx, or what was then Westchester County, at the edge of the city. And in the center of that space, um, he found the most incredible natural landscape um, that he'd ever seen, and he strongly advocated for that landscape to be set aside as the site for a future botanical garden. This was before Britain and Britain had gone on their honeymoon to Kew. So there's this great confluence of events. Um, the public spiritedness of John Mullaly and the parks movement, and the scientific and educational and cultural institution drive of the Britons. So sure enough, the land that is now the New York Botanical Garden was set aside in 1895, and work began immediately on an institution that had plant collections um, and a natural landscape that would serve its scientific and research programs. Um, the garden was laid out initially by Calvert Vox, who is Frederick Law Olmsted's partner in the creation of Central Park. Um, and it was created in the very uh, traditional 19th century way that botanical gardens were laid out. Um, a series of plant collections spread across the landscape um, arranged for ease of comparison. So someone who was a student of trees could go and see all the pine trees from the northern hemisphere and learn how to tell one from the other, see all the spruce trees next to the pines, and so on and so forth. A very traditional botanical garden. But at the heart of the garden was something even more miraculous. Um, considered to be the most beautiful natural area in the region in the 19th century was the 50-acre hemlock grove. Um, and through that ran the Bronx River. Mullaly again extolled the virtues, the scenic virtues, the beauty of this amazing place, and suggested that what better place for the establishment of an institution devoted to the study of plants than a place that had at its heart a beautiful old growth forest. And of course, that forest remains today uh, preserved, and that's one of the main subjects of my talk. Of course, a botanical garden needed the infrastructure for growing and displaying plants around the world. So the wonderful Enid A. Hauptman Conservatory was constructed beginning in 1899. It was completed in 1902. 
It was designed by the Lord and Burnham Greenhouse Company, uh, who designed great glass houses for all of the sort of, um, all the tycoons of the Gilded Age. Um, the garden now holds the archive. It's more than 200,000 documents of the Lord and Burnham firm. Um, and it is a miraculous and fun thing to look at. So there's the conservatory under construction. And there, of course, it is today. At the same time, uh, the garden started planting plant collections systematically across the landscape. So in the background, you can see the newly constructed conservatory, and in the foreground, a series of young pine trees. I would ask you to, to look at a few things in this slide which are very instructive. First of all, the topography of the garden um, was part of its great charm. You can see the rolling hills. Second of all, you can see the newly planted pine, tree, pine trees. This is around 1900. But in the background, you see a lot of mature old shade trees. So not only was there a forest at the heart of the garden, but around that forest, uh, in a series of pastures and old orchards, really quite beautiful old oaks and tulip trees and ashes and sweet gums, which the garden's founders preserved during, while constructing um, the landscape. And you can see them there in this early picture. Of course, trees grow. And there's one of the grand old pine trees today that was planted in the early part of the 20th century. That's a Korean pine. How many of you are fanatical about trees from around the world. <laughs> yeah, me too. So that's pretty cool. So that's an interesting tree. That's actually a Korean nut pine, um, which is the source of lesser pine nuts. If you're cheap like me and you buy your pine nuts kind of at discount, chances are it's from this species and not from the Italian stone pine, which is the traditional source of pine nuts. And behind it is one of the great um, flowering cherries the garden has in its landscape. And of course, um, eventually, uh, after the initial build out of the garden was complete and the conservatory was in place and the library was in place and the plant collections were in place, um, uh, like all great gardens, the garden never stopped growing. So in 1916, the garden commissioned Beatrix Ferrand, the great American landscape architect, to design a rose garden. And there it is in its early years. Quite beautiful. I think those are Model T's. I don't know, they're Model something or others in the background. And there's the garden today. And again, if you look in this picture, large trees in the background. In this picture, large trees in the background. Um, more than anything, um, these native trees, again, these great, great old oaks and hickories and, and, and tulip trees and sweet gums, kind of knit the garden's landscape together. If you've been there, you know it's very hilly and it's very big. It's 250 acres. Um, and it wasn't designed in the way that Central Park was designed. Um, it wasn't a blank slate and then constructed. It was. Um, it has been built over 125 years, and it has built, been built both with great respect for the natural landscape, but also kind of great frustration at the overwhelming power of the natural landscape. My predecessors could not have laid out a straight line in the garden if they had wanted to. It would have taken them years to blast away all the rock. Even Beatrix Farron designed her garden, um, which is very much a formal garden, um, in a triangle kind of tucked into a low valley in the south, south, southeastern part of the landscape. A powerful landscape um, that in many ways, um, well, I would say in every way, um, my predecessors uh, were brilliant to recognize and to preserve. So I'm going to talk about two elements of the landscape, both of which are related to the history of the institution and also to the great grandeur of the natural landscape. The first is the Thane family forest, uh, a 50-acre old growth forest and the heart of the New York Botanical Garden. And that, those words just kind of come out, and everyone kind of nods their head. Um, but it's remarkable to think that in the Bronx, in New York City, there are 50 acres of forest that, as far as we can tell, and we've done lots and lots and lots of research, and have been continuously forested since the glaciers melted and the tundra was invaded by early successional birches and the first forest got established. Now, the species have changed and the character of the forest has changed over the past, say, 12,000 years, but it has been continuously forested. A remarkable thing to think, because those of you who live in Connecticut who kind of take forests for granted might not realize that only 100 years ago, Connecticut was less than 25% forested. Um, the landscape had been denuded in the 18th and 19th centuries, uh, both for agriculture, but also for industrial forestry, primarily the making of charcoal to fuel um, uh, iron forges and other commercial and industrial things. So um, this is a miracle that surrounded by denuded landscapes. Um, adjacent to New York City, where people had to pay a fortune for firewood that this forest was preserved. 
Um, and here's a, an early picture uh, from the late 19th century, from the late 1800s uh, of the forest. And you can see the grand old forest grown trees. You can see the great exposed rock. That's a glacial pothole that, that looks like it's probably could be a sweet gum growing out of it. Um, a black birch certainly in the foreground. Um, it was recognized as a brilliantly beautiful site, not only by the garden's founders, but by Hudson River School painters. Here's an early painting from the 1850s of um, the, one of the Lorillard buildings. And the Lorillards are the great reason why the forest remains. The Lorillard family, uh, American tobacco dynasty, um, bought this land in 1792 um, and eventually sold it in 1870. And not only did they build their home um, at the garden, um, but they also built their factories at the garden. And they lived above within a few hundred yards of the factories that were churning out the snuff that made them gazillionaires in their day. And what's great about the Lorillards is that they had this forest that was right across the river um, from their factory. And again, it'd be a great source of timber for building, a great source of firewood to fire the furnaces and all of that, but they preserved it. Um, and one of the most incredibly foresighted things, um, they did something that really did not become in vogue in this country until the early 20th century. They actually preserved a slice of nature to enjoy. So there's a wonderful quote about the Lorillards and their role in the landscape. Um, and uh, I'll read it because it's a great quote. The late Peter Lorillard and his father owned this property for the better part of a century and took great pains to preserve its natural beauties, only assisting nature by here and there erecting bridges across the stream and making paths along its banks, forming numberless rambles from which one gets an ever-changing yet always impressive scene of forest, stream, and lake. That's late 19th century. This, the romantic view, you know, Emerson hadn't really caught on, Thoreau hadn't really caught on. This was not the typical view of, um, of 19th century Americans um, and 18th century Americans. Remember, they took this land over in 1792. Um, so again, that landscape uh, after the, the Lorillards uh, left for greener pastures, Tuxedo Park for their home and Jersey City for their factories, um, uh, sat there preserved. And again, I talked to you about John Mullally, whose great book, The New Parks Beyond the Harlem, was really one of the most, you should read it if you have, it's probably in this amazing library. It certainly is in our amazing library. Um, it, it's a, a combination of kind of dense economic rationale for preserving and creating parks um, and the most purple prose, just kind of glowingly talking about these great landscapes that should be preserved. And he was successful. And uh, he was successful because he was convincing. So here's another great quote from, from Mullally. It would be difficult to do justice to the exquisite loveliness of the tract without seeming to exaggerate. For the character of the scenery is so varied that every step is a surprise, and the artist and the wayfaring man might love to linger there. I mean, it's about 400 pages of this just kind of glowing kind of Hallmark card prose, but it was, it was effective. Again, in the early 20th century, it was called the most precious natural possession of the city of New York. This was the reason why the garden was established on its site in 1895. This was the sort of intellectual heart of the institution, kind of from which flowed all of our great scientific work and our great horticulture, and it has been preserved for a long time. Here's a great uh, uh, Samuel uh, Robert, Rob, Robinson Gifford painting and a great quote from the Olmsted firm, which took over the property, uh, did a master plan for the garden in 1924. Um, again, glowing, glowing descriptions of this great landscape. So, the forest. As far as we can tell, it's been around for 12,000 years. Um, never cleared, certainly individual, individual trees have been lost or cut down. Um, and it's been extolled, its virtues have been extolled by, by scientists and poets um, and designers alike. But the forest is not unchanged. The forest is not pristine. Um, the forest, like every aspect of our landscape, bears the scars of, of kind of human activity, um, anthropogenic disturbance. And the first documented uh, disturbance is the arrival of chestnut blight. You've all heard of chestnut blight, correct? 19, uh, 1904, it was discovered at the Bronx Zoo, which is right next to the New York Botanical Garden. We share with the two, the northern and southern halves of Bronx Park. And almost immediately, it spread throughout the entire region, and you all know the rest of the story. What was 
one of the most abundant tree species uh, in the eastern half of the country was eliminated by about the 1930s. There are a handful of saplings or well, actually kind of root stumps that sprout here and there, but what, what was the most important tree, gone. There were about a thousand of them in the forest that were dead by 1910. Another disturbance, another human disturbance was being a public space. Um, that's 410 jacks in the pulpit. We all know that plant, wonderful native wildflower. They were, these were uh, confiscated by Elizabeth Gertrude Knight Britton um, from a school group that had gone to the forest with their teacher um, and felt that wouldn't it be great to dig all those pretty wildflowers uh, from the middle of the forest. Um, this and acts like it, this act and acts like it, really inspired Elizabeth Britton to be one of the first conservationists of native wildflowers in our country. So human disturbance in all, all of its forms. Here's a great, um, great letter from the head of the, the Bronx Zoo um, to Elizabeth Gertrude Knight Britton. Um, I'll read it because it's, it's quite wonderful. This is 1924. Thank you very much for your letter and for your success in discovering Arbutus and our circumpolar regions, meaning that of the of the landscape at the zoo. Mr. Merkel was surprised and pleased, and he is going to search out the last survivors and see what he can do to protect them. There are numerous practical difficulties in the way of fence protection. In the way of fence protection, it will not do to attract attention to the plant because if we should do so, nothing but a steel bar cage would be adequate to keep off the vandals. Mm -hmm. However, something must be done. That is clear. Barbed wire would be nice if it were not against the law and very fruitful of damaged suits. Thank you gratefully for having found the plants and opening up the road to their preservation. This is 1924 in the last remaining slice of old growth forest in New York City. Um, it was being loved to death. Um, and the reason why this plant is so important, Arbutus, trailing Arbutus, Epigea repens, is that it was one of the species that Nathaniel Britton noted on his initial survey of the site as a reason why the garden should be established there. It was being loved to death in, 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 in more subtle ways. Here's a great romantic picture from the early 1900s of a man uh, relaxing um, beneath the shade of a massive and ancient hemlock tree. Um, well, about 20 years later, um, signs like this started popping up throughout the forest. Um, imagine, you've all heard of the concept of the soil compaction. Right, soil compaction we know because we're enlightened now um, deprives the soil of oxygen um, and plants growing in the soil of oxygen they need to survive. You can imagine the impacts of tens or hundreds of thousands of little feet, big feet, um, uh, trampling through the forest year in and year out in this public garden. So again, there were paths of the forest the Laurel Arts had created, um, but people like to ignore paths. Um, just as they like to ignore uh, most things um, that limit their behavior. There are also other more subtle impacts in the forest over time, um, which have had an amazing and measurable impact on the forest health. Um, the New York Botanical Garden uh, is squirrel heaven. Quite frankly, if you were a squirrel, it is where you would want to be. Um, and that is born by the science um, and studies done in the 1980s or 1980s um, in preparation for creating a forest management plan, forest ecologists found that the squirrel populations were more than 10 times what would be expected in a similar landscape in rural areas, say in Darien, Connecticut. Um, so the squirrels were off the chart. What do squirrels do? Eat. Yeah, the squirrels eat. So the, the garden's forest now, the canopy is largely composed of um, oaks and hickories. Um, there aren't many oaks and hickories in the understory. And there are 275 to 300 year old oaks and hickories towering above your head. Obviously, um, you know, 10 or more times the expected populations of squirrels prevent a lot of acorns from germinating. There's also things that you can't see that are equally damaging. Um, we are, of course, in New York City, and we are kind of due north, maybe a little bit northeast of Midtown Manhattan. And those of you who have been in Midtown Manhattan, say, on an August day when the winds are coming from the southwest, and it's 1973, and there are no, there's no Clean Air Act, or maybe the Clean Air Act hasn't fully been implemented and every car and bus and train and apartment building is just churning out pollutants in an incredible clip. Well, that would all go up 
in the air in Manhattan and come down in the rain in the Bronx. And so you can measure the heavy metals, copper, zinc, lead, cadmium, and so on and so forth, um, in incredible, uh, incredible depths, incredible amounts in the forest soil. So here you have an old growth forest that has, by sight, not changed very much, but in function and chemistry um, changed a great deal. And of course, maybe the, the most um, noticeable blow is the arrival of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Have you ever all heard of that? Yeah. Right, so um, the forest was called the hemlock grove. If you saw in those early maps, it was called the hemlock grove because there was a stand of mature hemlocks that rivaled, well, this is um, maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. I'm going putting on my John Mulally hat. Um, it felt a lot like uh, the, the coast redwoods of California, not as big perhaps, certainly, not as fat perhaps, certainly, but that same kind of cathedral feeling where you have these massive trunks and these quiet needle covered floors and it's evergreen up until as high as you can see and there are snags, that same feeling, that really was the forest that, that Britain fell in love with. It was only about 30% of the forest, quite frankly, our science has indicated, but today um, it's basically 0% of the forest. The hemlocks have all been lost by the hemlock woolly adelgid, which came over in Hurricane Gloria in the 1980s. And here's a map of the sort of spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid over the past 40 years. And then, of course, invasive exotic species. Many of these you know, are our own damn fault. Um, you know, we're a botanical garden. And we've been growing plants from around the world because that's our mission for nearly 125 years. And you know, sure enough, some of those have escaped cultivation in the garden and work their way into the forest. Some of the invasive species that are in the forest are just have been here since the 18th century, long before the garden ever grew them there. Um, but there are many established populations of things like Japanese honeysuckle, um, uh, Amer cork tree, uh, Amer honeysuckle, um, the Japanese uh, devil's walking stick. They're in the forest. They're not dominant in the forest, but they're in the forest. And if we do nothing, um, they'll expand. There are places where all you can see um, are invasive exotic species. And this is, these are the banks of the Bronx River, which bisects the forest. And there's one of our, um, uh, one of our gardeners, and we're doing a great project to study the best control methods for, Jap uh, for Japanese knotweed, AKA Fallopia japonica. Um, in some ways, you have to kind of take your hat off to these two plants. Um, again, the taller plant with the gardener is Japanese knotweed. Um, the uh, smaller yellow flower plant is something called Lesser Celandine or Ranunculus ficaria or Ficaria verna. You all know that plant? Huh? It looks like Calthopolestris. Yeah, it does. It looks a lot like marsh marigold. No, hoo, hoo, hoo. It's, it's not, unfortunately. No, it's. Um, it's one of those, like, you know, you haven't seen it yet, but you will, plants. Um, it's all up and down the Bronx River Corridor. Um, and I have to say that I sort of show this slide. You are enlightened. I look at you and I know. You're here on Tuesday night. You must be enlightened. So I don't worry about showing this slide to you. Um, but there are people who are like, ooh, pretty. You know, that's, you know, <laughs> as far as you can see, yellow flowers. Who doesn't like yellow flowers as far as the eye can see? Why would you ever worry about that? Well, that's the floodplain of the forest. And there are literally dozens of species, if not hundreds of species, that were there 125 years ago that are basically gone there. And um, so these are, these are the real bad actors. And we are trying to figure out ways to control them and um, we're, it's, it's hard. It's, we're not having much success, actually. Um, but we're not giving up. So if you look at this inventory of plants in the forest, uh, really spontaneous plants in the whole garden landscape, but largely the forest in 1998, it was a wonderful mix of plants, um, really quite diverse. Uh, but our botanists have gone back to taking a look at this in the past few years. And they found a few things that have happened in the past 125 years. Um, the, num the, the, the total number of spontaneous flowering plant species has been reduced from 564 to 455. Um, in, eight, in, 19, in 1898, native plants were 82.8% of the flora. Today, they're about 58% of the flora. Exotic species have increased, basically doubled um, over that time. 
and of the six species that were listed in the Tory Botanical Society field report describing that land, um, five of, their, of them are gone entirely. So that's 125 years um, in a forest that has been protected, um, mechanically and physically protected, um, that has been run and managed by botanists who care deeply and are aware of these things. Um, uh, it's a pretty remarkable set of changes. There aren't very many other places that had this kind of data set around. Um, and so it, we, we learn a lot. Um, it's not all bad news. Um, it's just, these are just the facts. And what I love about kind of ecology and nature is that you just, you just have to learn the facts and make your judgments and, and, and kind of respond based on a, a kind of a rational approach. So our rational approach was the forest is the reason why the garden was established on the site. It is still largely native. Um, it is still glorious. There are still populations of rare and unusual native plants growing there. And it has some issues. Um, we're not going to garden the forest. It's 50 acres. Um, we could never afford to take care of the garden of the forest in the same way that we take care of, say, the conservatory. Um, it's just unsustainable. It's impossible. Um, but maybe we can do a few things to try to peel back the negative human influences, the anthrop anthropogenic problems that we're observing that I've just shown you all. Everything I just showed you, every kind of grim bit of data has to do with human influences over time. So we started working on this about five or six years ago. The garden has, in all full disclosure, for the past hundred years, had moments of let's go in and do things in the forest, and they've done things and gone out, and done things and gone out. Um, but really, for the past five years or so, we've redoubled our efforts in terms of forest stewardship. I call this Bronx Gothic. And we have a wonderful um, group of members and volunteers who come and just with kind of, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you know, enthusiasm, <laughs> kill invasive exotic species. Um, we have removed um, uh, or killed about 800 annual cork trees. And you can see some of these things are huge. These are trees that are native to northeastern Asia. Um, they were absolutely planted in the garden. I can show you the maps from their original planting in the early 20th century. Um, and they are bird dispersed to go back. So it's that thing in the lower right-hand corner uh, as you look at the screen. And um, if you were going to design the perfect invasive tree, this is the tree. And none of you have ever heard of it, or maybe a few of you have. It has never become a huge problem. Thankfully, this tree was never widely planted, like, say, Norway maple was. Um, it's bird dispersed. Most of our most terrible invasive species are. Sort of ironically, the native birds seem to be happy eating their fruits. Um, it's both shade and sun tolerant. Uh, it is drought tolerant. Um, it it is, has no predators in this part of the world. And over 125 years, it's kind of it's radiated from the spot that it was planted. So you know, within a few hundred feet of the grove that were planted, there were hundreds of trees. Um, as you went further and further away, there were fewer and fewer. So we've been going through and removing those. Um, and it's hard to see in this picture. Um, this is a beautiful facility, by the way. What a nice library. Very impressive. <laughs> it really is. It's great. It's nice. The screen is beautiful. Everything, it's like everything works. Um, it's rare. So if you look, hmm, oh, someone has disabled my, uh, the, of course, this is my own pointer. Oh, so uh, I think the one they gave me probably works. Oh, whatever it is. Okay. It's a microphone. Anyway, if you look at the bottom, there's like a green carpet, right? So what happens when you uh, cut the tree down um, that's probably 85 to 90 years old? Um, and, and they're dioecious, which means there are male and females. Um, this was a female. Well, you open up the canopy and you allow light and the seed bank, all the seeds that have been accumulating in the soil over the past 85 years, um, are all of a sudden, ooh, light, water, air, great. It was a carpet of... Um, of cork tree, I mean literally a carpet. And so these are um, students pulling one after the other of these little seedlings of cork tree um, and doing it so merrily. Again, um, you've never seen such enthusiasm for killing plants in your whole life. Um, the really great and cool thing is, and I don't have a picture, but I'll talk about it as we sort of move forward. Um, that actually I'll talk about it before I move forward. Um, the 
we, you could see the, the small trees that are planted. There's a little oak, a little, little ash, um, of various things that we've planted, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, those are all still alive, but this site right now, this was probably four years ago, this photograph. This site right now is all tulip trees that are about as thick as my thumb and about 10 feet tall. So as soon as we released the seed bank and then eliminated this generation of court trees that was about to take over, the native species were able to do their thing. And that really is the idea behind our restoration of the forest. We're not going to garden it. We're trying to allow these natural processes to reestablish themselves. Um, and one way that we do that is we collect seeds in the forest. You remember the squirrels. So if we were to allow the oaks and hickories to just try to reseed themselves, well, we would be 100% unsuccessful because the squirrels would beat us to every last acorn and hickory nut. So what we do is we hang out these great contraptions, and they're out in the forest right now, um, where the acorns and hickory nuts are collected, um, and we you know, kind of battle the squirrels <laughs> and then grab them and bring them down to the nursery. And, uh, and plant them, and then we plant the seeds in the forest. And that's not because I think the forest should be oak. The forest maybe should be black cherry, or maybe it should be sweet gum, or maybe it should be tulip tree, the things that have seemed to be resilient. Um, but I know that if I don't do any planting, that there's no way in hell, there's no possible chance that it will be oak at all. And I am a little bit of an oak chauvinist, I have to say. Um, but I'm trying to not let my own personal feelings get involved in the mix here. Um, and so we're planting some. And we don't think that the oaks um, that we're planting are going to be dominating the canopy at any point in the future. But we are preserving this germplasm for the future that so somebody else in the future at least has the opportunity to um, be an oak chauvinist just like me. <laughs> and we're planting, 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 planting. We planted, I don't even know, maybe 10,000 saplings in the past four or five years. I kind of lose track. Um, the volunteer groups, there's no, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, there's no better way to engage people um, than to um, have them plant a tree. That was a wonderful quote, and I agree with that. I use that quote, I butcher that quote regularly as part of talks. So I'm glad to have heard it more or less as it was. And we're also planting um, herbaceous things. Um, again, you saw that original list. There were, there were many species of wildflowers and ferns and great native um, herbaceous plants. Um, and there are still quite a few that exist. Um, these are some of the winners, um, although there are far fewer ferns than you would expect. If you walked around a kind of a deer-ravaged forest in Darien or New Canaan, you'll see more ferns growing spontaneously than you will at the nearby town garden. I think that's for two reasons. I think that's because of the, the I think people collected them. I think people dug them up in the early 20th century. And I think it has to do with the soil chemistry, too. The soil's just probably that copper or that cadmium or that lead is not conducive to growing ferns. So we're also planting those as well. Um, and so we have a healthy, um, happy, beautiful, interesting um, place now, the forest. Uh, and we've been doing a lot of work recently to sort of invite people in so they can see um, the result of all this work and thought. Um, and if you're going to invite people into your forest in a public garden in New York City, you probably shouldn't muddy their shoes. Um, uh, and the trails to the forest, which really do date back to the Lorelar time, and actually probably date back to Native American trails before then, um, based on the size and the shape of the trees around them, they're quite old. Um, they've been trod upon for forever. And one of the key management strategies in the forest is to keep people on the trails and out of um, the main part of the forest for soil compaction and other reasons. Um, so if you're going to do that, you probably should have not nasty, muddy, and unwelcoming trails. So we worked with Anthropogon Associates um, to create a really clever and I think beautiful trail system through the forest. And one of my main concerns was, you know, I didn't want asphalt for obvious reasons. Asphalt is really very a practical surface, um, or concrete, or one of the fancy trail surfaces we might use in the rest of the garden. I wanted the trails to work functionally, but to blend visually into the forest. So um, they come out, came up with a great kind of um, a graded mix of of stone. You know, no cement, no lime, um, just stone that's put down wet and and, and packed with a vibrator. Thing called the lacquer. You all seen those lacquers? Very cool. And then, in, in particularly low, wet spots, they built these stone fords. Um, and they've worked beautifully. They've been in the forest for four years, and they take some maintenance, um, but they're really quite beautiful and um, really quite effective. Um, here's an old, uh, old in the south, southern end of the forest. This is actually the part of the forest that I would bring people to 
when I wanted to teach them about old growth forests, because this is the part of the forest where the trees were kind of biggest and grandest. You can see American beeches, you can see a sweet gum right in the front there. It's protected, there are two parallel ridges, and this is a little valley between the ridges, that's where the trees are really kind of the oldest. And you can see there's this really nasty old kind of concrete slab which we replaced with a wonderful arched bridge. Um, and you can see the size and grandeur of the trees. Um, a beautiful, great spot of the forest. Um, we'll talk more about it in a minute. So now, who's coming? Um, lots of volunteers, lots of New York City school children get like, I think it's about 90,000 school children to the garden every year, and a goodly number of them come into the forest. Um, researchers who are studying you know, the populations of everything um, and finding actually that in spite of all of that kind of grim bad news that I shared at the beginning, the forest is remarkably healthy and resilient. Um, living things are enjoying the forest. There's a fox. We have camera traps where we trap things. And can you all make out what, the, what is it on the right? It's actually a great horned owl. Um, we have nesting great horned owls, and there is nothing more cuddly and charming than great horned owlets um, that are like, you know, posing uh, outside. They're kind of, they, they, they nest in hollow trees at the edge of the forest, and they pose, and um, when the owlets come out, they're just these little fuzzballs, and people stop and take pictures for hours. The largest lenses you've ever seen on cameras. Four foot long lenses. So there's my new bridge. That's Sandy. Um, garden wide, we lost about 300 trees, um, 100 years old and older. Um, the oldest one measures about 260 years old, an oak. Um, about half of those in the forest and half elsewhere. In the forest, we're leaving the trunks. We cleaned up the paths and rebuilt the bridge. But we're leaving the trunks uh, in the forest because A, it's good habitat, and B, you can imagine a 260-year-old oak has been taking up micronutrients and things from the soil for its entire life. To take that wood out of the forest, um, the forest would figure it out, it'd be okay, um, but we figure it's kind of adding insult to injury. We really want to try to restore the health of the soil because really the soil is the foundation of the health of the entire ecosystem. Um, so in spite of all that, um, the forest remains a beautiful and magical and wonderful place and I hope you come and visit it. All right, so are you guys game for some more natal plant garden? Um, all right, because I'm looking at the clock. There's just staring at me. Apparently, I'm rambling. Um, I'll try to go a little bit more quickly. We may go a little bit late start. But so the kind of parallel project um, to the forest in my, in my career at the garden has been the native plant garden. Um, the forest restoration has been about understanding the threats it faces and increasing access and increasing forest health. The native plant garden has been a different project. It's adjacent to the forest. It shares a, a boundary with the forest, which is part of its great charm. Um, but it's about a couple of things. It's about our institutional dedication to the study of plants native to northeastern North America. Remember Mr. Britton and Mrs. Britton? Well, Mr. Britton wrote a book called Britton and Brown, which was basically the first textbook describing all of the plants native, um, well, you can read. Uh, the northern United States, Canada, and the British possessions from Newfoundland to the parallel of the southern boundary of Virginia and from the Atlantic Ocean westward to the 102nd meridian. Basically, from the southern boundary of Virginia to the eastern edge of the Great Plains, north to the maritime provinces, Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. Um, all of the plants spontaneously growing in that part of the world, we literally wrote the book on um, in the late 19th century. This is, this is the second edition. The first edition was in the 1890s. Um, Elizabeth Gertrude Knight Britton, again, was a moss expert, but because of her experience in the forest, watching these populations of native wildflowers dwindle, you know, assassinated by school children in leather boots, um, she became an ardent protector of wildflowers. She became a passionate advocate for preserving wildflowers, not only in and around New York City, um, but across North America. And this was, again, well before anyone was talking about the Endangered Species Act um, or really conservation of organisms. Now, in the early 20th century, conservation of landscapes uh, was in vogue. Uh, but conservation of organisms, of populations, um, was not much thought about, way ahead of her time. Like the Laurelards were ahead of their time in pres preserving the landscape. She was ahead of her time in communicating about the threats that the things that lived in the landscape were facing. So we've had a native plant garden for a long time at the garden, really since um, the 1930s. 
Um, that plaque, uh, as you see, dated 1940, the New York Bird and Tree Club, um, uh, marked a location where we had a wildflower garden dedicated to Elizabeth Britton, Gertrude Knight Britton's memory. Um, and here's that spot, I guess six years ago or so. Um, and when I, full disclosure, started working at the garden um, when I was still in graduate school, uh, it's where I spent all of my lunch hours. I was actually working in a lab, um, but I loved the native plant garden. And the reason why I loved the native plant garden because I was at that stage in my life just voraciously consuming native plants, not eating them. I was learning as much as I could. I wanted to go wherever I went, it, I went on a hike, if it was on the beach in the Hamptons, um, uh, if it was in the Berkshires, wherever, I wanted to know what every plant I saw was called. Every plant. And um, I was a sort of fierce autodidact. My background was not in biology, so I felt like I had a lot, a lot of catching up to do. And I think I knew you know, a good 60% of them at that, this stage in my life. So I would go there and look at all these great native plants. I wasn't looking at a garden. I, wasn't, I didn't care if it was pretty, ugly. I was looking at the plants in the garden. But that was our native plant garden. And it was um, originally kind of a wooded area. And then in the 60s and 70s, it was redesigned to be a series of recreations of native biomes. So that little pine tree on the left-hand side of the frame, that was um, the pine barrens. And then there was the Hempstead Plains, and then there was a little ditch that was, you know, there were all these kind of major landscape ecosystems that were recreated or evoked or introduced through these dinky, kind of not tying together very well um, kind of habitats. And I love the idea because it allowed you to kind of shoehorn a lot of different native plants from our region into one small place, and it's great, great from an educational perspective. Um, and, but it wasn't successful from a horticultural perspective. Um, and it had a lot of turf in it. The story behind the turf is, is, is a long one I won't bore you with, but suffice it to say, it's a little strange to go to a native plant garden and see a, like three acres of mown grass. <laughs> and that was the site from, um, from above. And you can see the top of the screen is the edge of the Thane family forest, that old growth forest. Um, at the bottom of the screen is, a, is another ridge. There, again, there are two ridges and a valley. Incredible topography. Um, that valley is where the turf was. The land goes up on either side. That valley, it's hard to see here, had basically a drainage ditch. Um, which you can see about midway through the screen, there are two bridges that cross it, or through this, uh, and that was a drainage ditch. So that's what it was. Turf, a drainage ditch, and a bunch of half-assed um, uh, uh, copies of grand ecosystems from the region. Well, that's what was designed. Um, uh, working with Uma van Sweden, the great landscape architects, um, we designed a garden using native plants. And the idea behind that was we have the forest, which really is wilderness or close to it. Um, we have 20,000 types of plants from around the world. Uh, we have lots of native plants in cultivation. Um, we want to celebrate native plants, and we want people who have no interest in plants or gardening to come and say, wow, what's this? The space is wonderful. Whoa, these are native plants? These are plants native to the northeastern North America? How cool is that? And so we wanted to celebrate our long tradition of studying these plants. We wanted to celebrate them as components of a landscape and as components of a garden. Um, we didn't want to advocate for them in any kind of over-the-top way. We wanted them to advocate for themselves. So to do so, we created a series of habitats. The first one um, that I'll show you is the meadows. So of course you remember, a meadow is really, there are very few natural meadows in our part of the world. The prairie is a kind of a Midwest thing where fire is a big part of the ecosystem. You know, Pre-colonization, um, Native Americans burned the understory of forests, and there are probably some patchy meadows here or there. But basically, if you walk away from anywhere in our part of the world, with very few exceptions, in 25 years, it's going to be a forest. So a meadow is already, in our part of the world, a totally, it's a concoction. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fantasy. Um, but it's a nice fantasy. Um, so we had this great site that ranged from the wet edge of that drainage ditch up to this kind of dry ridge, and you can see it from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen from wet to dry. And working with Uma van Sweden, we envisioned um, large swaths, large gestures, masses of plants interplanted for different flowering interest over the seasons, um, but on a huge scale, not one or two of this, but one or two thousand of this or that. Um, we wanted plants that would thrive in wet, sunny locations, medium sunny locations, and dry sunny locations, all kind of mushed together, but in a way that was kind of 
thought through and aesthetic and pretty. So there's the site, um, pre-meadow. As you can see, that that's the turf. We've done some removal of some of the trees um, to prepare. You can see that wonderful glacial erratic rock at the top. That's a gift of the last glacier. It's a Yonkers Nice from about 10 miles away from the garden. It's glorious. We call it split rock. And then you can see the garden kind of around. So there you go. And you can see the drainage very clearly. We hired, you know, actually, I don't see them here. They said they might come. They're probably working. Um, but Darien is home to, I would say, the best um, commercial horticulture firm I've ever had the pleasure of working with, which is called Doms. Um, and we found Doms through somebody else, somewhere else. Um, and that's Chris operating the front end loader. Um, but they did the kind of core site work um, in the native plant garden, and they are the best. I shouldn't say that because then you're going to hire them and then they'll be more expensive for me. <laughs> or terrible. Don't even think about it. Um, and again, you'd think a native plant garden would be kind of simple. You just kind of do this and that, throw some plants in and you're done. But no, um, this is not simple. In order to create the meadow, um, not only do we have to grade it for the water to work properly, but kind of counter horticultural common sensely, um, you have to manufacture soil that is very depauperate that's impoverished of nutrients. These meadow plants tend to not have a competitive advantage in your typical garden soil. The weeds have an advantage in garden soil. So to get meadows to perform the way you need them to, you have to create the crappiest possible soil that money will buy. And that's what we did. I mean, it's, it has to have the right drainage, it has to be free draining, it can't be too wet, um, but it can't also have very much nitrogen or other nutrients or much organic matter. Um, and then it has to be exactly compacted as a soil probe, um, everything measured to within an inch of its life. And then it's planted. And so here's some of our gardeners. And um, you can see what was planted plugs, things about the size of my thumb, maybe a little bit bigger, um, from nurseries throughout the region. A great mix of grasses and forbs, all the great things you want to have. And, um, you know, that's not looking so promising. Um, we knew this is, uh, this is actually the, the fall of 2011, actually the summer, August of 2011. Um, and we knew that we were opening this garden in May of 2013. There's a split rock. So they're planted. And um, this was uh, finished up on a Saturday morning. And on Saturday afternoon, Hurricane Irene came, um, which was a raining hurricane, not a windy hurricane. Sandy was a windy hurricane and not a raining hurricane. Um, but lo and behold, these pathetic little plants in this crappy soil seem to hold on. Uh, some of them kind of popped up and floated away, and we kind of dug them back and stuck them back. Um, it was actually, it was kind of great. It was sort of promising. You see a little goldenrod, you know, very gamely flowering. But that's what you're looking at. You're looking at, you can see how sandy the soil is. It's about a couple of acres, probably, the meadow, maybe, maybe not quite, of just sand with these little wisps. You know, it looks like... You know, somebody allowed the sand in the parking lot that they used in the winter, they allowed it to sit there, you know, in the summer, and then some crabgrass popped up in the middle of it when we planted it in September of 2011. That's the meadow this, this late spring. That's the meadow this kind of June, June-ish. It's the meadow in August. That's the meadow only a few weeks ago. That's, um, that's two years of growth from plugs, I remind you, <laughs> small, tiny plants, because we invested in crappy soil. Um, and uh, and it, lo and behold, it worked. Um, it's remarkable. Again, there's, it's totally artificial. It's totally designed. There's split rock again for, 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 for um, a reference. Uh, but one of the things that we've spoken about when we talked about the native plant garden, we said these are great for wildlife. They're great for birds. Uh, what do we know about birds? You know, we're plant people. Um, but we read somewhere that it's great for birds. I tell you, as soon as we planted this bed, as soon as the stuff started growing, the birds showed up. And you can't believe the birds that are in and out of this meadow all the time. It's wonderful, really the whole garden. But the meadow's goldfinches and yellow throats and lark sparrows and things that we just didn't see that often, or if you did, never in concentration. And they read the press releases, and um, <laughs> they're giving us their thumbs up. All right, so there's also a woodland. So again, this garden is adjacent to the forest. So you have the meadow, which is sunny from wet sun to dry sun. And you have the woodland, which is from wet shade to dry shade. Um, and again, 
uh, planted, designed by Uma van Sweden, and these massive, these great masses of plants. Um, a lot of the spring ephemerals, the things that flower in the spring and then it go away by the time summer comes around. Um, huge quantities of plants, tens of thousands of this, um, literally thousands of trilliums, um, Tiarella, foam flower. Um, quite beautiful, taking advantage of uh, the shady conditions in the forest. So that was sort of the site before. Um, that's kind of a, an example at the edge of the native plant garden in the forest. You can see there's some understory. We don't have deer at the garden. So there actually is an understory. It's often invasive species, but at least it's there. Um, and you can see it's a mix, as any old growth forest would, of large trees and small trees, a kind of a gap or a mosaic type structure. Um, and then we cleared out the understory, uh, preserving the trees. And you can see one of the great tricks of gardening on a massive scale, you use lots of ribbon, so you can visualize your masses, so you can just see them, figure out where you plant these things. Because you're planting uh, 90,000 and counting plants in the garden so far. Um, and you're trying to get it in. This is March of 2011, so it's before the meadow. And you can see in the background the forest and some old roadies that we preserved. So we preserved the trees, obviously, and we worked with the landscape. Um, again, my intrepid crew of horticulturists um, just planting a lot of plants, uh, big piles of um, plastic, which is all recycled, thankfully. And you can see the forest in the background. You can see the rock. See that oak? That looks like it's just kind of, um, it's like a Dali painting. It's kind of melting from the rock. It's one of the, I'll point if you can't see it. I mean, there's no amount of, you could never do that on purpose. <laughs> Um, that's, a, that's an oak that germinated in a crack, an acorn that germinated a crack in a rock probably 85 years ago and just had the right combination of moist summers and protection and no squirrels um, to go on top of the rock. Very, very, very cool. And there are many moments like that in the garden. And, you know, as much as we like to pat ourselves on the back and say our beautiful design and exhibitions are what make the garden special, it, 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 this as much makes the garden special in my mind. And there it is, that same, um, so this is March 11, that's May 11. Um, quite beautiful, you see the foam flower, and that's this spring. I know it's very kind of emboldening. Um, always skeptical before you embark upon one of these projects, but to see it happen. In fact, both the meadow and the woodland, you know, we, we subscribe to the Olmsteady notion of planting thick and thinning quick. Um, we're, they're, they're all in desperate need of thinning we ever planted. And the cool thing about the woodland is that when the ephemerals are done, and that, this is you know uh, April and early May, but then when they're done, um, this, these wonderful sweeps of ferns and sedges and other shade tolerant woodland plants that aren't um, showy flowers, in some cases flowers at all, kind of take over. And, the, and it, the texture and the form and the color of the plants becomes what you see. And I actually love looking at it this time of year as much as I do at that time of the year. And then there's a the wetland and water feature. And the heart of the garden and what was the drainage ditch um, is now um, basically a water feature that is um, ornamental. Uh, the goal here was to allow the storm water that used to kind of course through the site to continue its way down to the Bronx River, um, but to create some kind of wonderful impact without depending on, on city water. So you all know that Central Park has those great water features and those are just giant open taps. That's just plumbing. Um, and we have just upstream of here our great historic rock garden built in the 1930s and it has a cascade. It's gorgeous, very 1930s horticulture and that forever was just an open tap. Just water running and running and running and running. And we thought that, you know, in 1930 that was probably not even thought twice about. Um, but in 2010 or 9 when we started this, um, we didn't want to just waste water. We wanted to have a water feature but we wanted to do it um, as sustainably as possible. Um, so basically we created a water feature that collects all the storm water from the site, stores it in giant underground cisterns, it's 50,000 gallons of storage, and then pumps uh, the water from the cisterns into the basin and pumps the water in the basin in a big rotating um, biofiltration scheme where water pumps from the lower end all the way up comes up through um, a plant wetland. Those, the roots of those plants are taking up nutrients to prevent algae growth. There are bacteria growing gravel, which also prevent algae growth, and then clear out plant space for aesthetics and so on and so forth. And we don't ever turn a tap on. It's all self-contained. It's like a giant swimming pool. And of course, the wetland, the biofiltration wetland, is, is also gives us the opportunity to plant a lot of really cool wetland plants, um, including the hibiscus. Um, 
which is, uh, or Swamp Rose, which is in the lower center. And that is the plant I see more people taking pictures of. It looks completely exotic, but it is completely native. And you can probably see it in growing in kind of swamps and areas in, in Darien still today. And so that's a view up. Um, there's that drainage ditch. You can see the woods on the side that we preserved and the grass uh, that we turned into a meadow. Those big uh, conifers on the left-hand side of the screen are called torea. They're actually from Japan. They're dated back to the original layout of the garden, and we preserve those. Um, and there's the construction. That's the old, uh, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Um, you see that we preserved all the giant trees and tried to protect them as best we could as we were running these enormous excavators for weeks on end. And that's the final product. Um, and you can see the duck in the middle again. They read the press release. Um, the wonderful black locust promenade along the side. Um, wonderful, I mean, interesting and contemporary by design. Um, in the winter, um, it kind of in, in, in the other view, it looks almost like a meandering river. Um, and then as the lobelia cardinalis, the cardinal flower, come and flower in the summer, everything kind of softens. And it sits quite beautifully in the landscape. It's a very flashy thing. And we're not really very flashy people. Um, but if you go see it, it really is. Uma um, Van Sweden did a great job of kind of combining it with the topography in a way. And, and the way we looked at this is that we wanted a contemporary garden. We didn't want to put a garden here um, that you might not realize was a garden. Um, we didn't want to try to make it faux nature in any way. We wanted to celebrate design, plantsmanship, drama, vistas, plant combinations, all the great things that make great gardens great and pretty. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. And here's um, with the um, Minarda raspberry wine in full flower, just beautiful throughout the year. And again, um, we've had lots and lots and lots of visitors and uh, both, uh, both two-legged and two-winged and, and lots of insects and, and um, it's a lot of fun. So collectively, those are the two projects that have been consuming a great deal of my time over the past few years. And um, it, it, they were a lot of fun to build. Um, they're great because they really capture the essence of my institution, which is more than anything devoted to making people like you and people like me I'm more aware of and more passionate about the plants that sustain us. So thank you all for the opportunity. And If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sir. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, chestnut, the fact that they're basically gone from this part of the world? Can you talk a little bit more about what you at Campfern do with regard to trying to at least preserve the species or keep some specimen trees lying with the chestnuts, elms? OK. So did you all hear the question? What are you doing to help chestnuts and elms? That was sort of what I got out of that. Um, uh, and, uh, and the answer is, um, actually, it's a good question, because uh, for both chestnuts, American chestnuts and elms, um, we have been actively planting them, uh, not in the forest so much, um, but in our living collections. And the reason is, is that there are a number of American elm. You all know the American elm story, also like chestnuts, decimated by uh, a fungal disease, um, but not eliminated. So there are a number of cultivars, cultivated varieties of American elm that are resistant to Dutch elm disease. Um, uh, New Harmony, Valley Forge, Washington. These are pretty commercially available now. So we've been planting those in the landscape. Um, there are also American elms that are in the garden that predate the garden. Um, so there are wild elms that are still alive that we actually treat. We do the injections um, on only a handful. It would be prohibitively expensive to do them on all of them. One in particular, um, uh, which is, I forgot to plug my book. There's a, a picture of, um, of, of, of it in this, uh, in this wonderful book. In fact, I'll open it and show you the picture. Um, uh, and so we take care of that one. And so we have them newly planted, we have them pre-existing, and we're doing what we can to preserve them. As for American chestnut, just a few years ago, we started to partner with the American Chestnut Society, um, who are crazy people. Um, and you have to admire their chutzpah. I mean, they, they really want to reestablish the American chestnut as an important component of the forest in, in, in eastern North America, which is you know, a very daunting task. Um, 
you know, chest stem is basically gone. There are no reproducing. Because of the biology of the disease, they don't get to reproducing age. They just die. So they've done a few things. They've found some isolated specimens that are either resistant or just far enough away from the initial infestation that they're still alive. So we have some of the seeds from seedlings from those. They've done crosses between American chestnut and uh, Chinese chestnut, Castania mollissima, uh, that are showing great resistance. And they do back crosses and back crosses. So they're like 94% American chestnut and you know 6% Chinese chestnut. They've also done GMOs, where they've inserted a gene from another organism, I forget which, um, into the, the embryonic uh, chestnuts. Um, to see if that will create resistance. And we've planted some of those. We have a permit from uh, the USDA to grow those on site. I don't, I don't quite get those, because I just sort of think, are you just going to plant a gazillion of these things around the world, and then they're going to grow and not be able to reproduce? Um, but we'll see. We'll see if they survive. So we're testing them. So that's, that's, that's what we're doing about elms and chestnuts. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Anyone else? I'm sorry. I'm looking up this. Uh. Any other questions? Sorry. Okay. Uh, you were talking about um, growing the metal and growing the soil conditions. If you had different sections that you were planting, some in moist shade, some in uh, light moisture, some in dry sun, some in dry shade, were you using that horrible soil in all of those uh, growing conditions? No. Um, the question is, do we use the same um, kind of bad depauperate soil across the plant garden? No, only in the meadow. Um, because the meadow plants in particular um, uh, tend to thrive in low nutrient soils or tend to have a competitive advantage is really the way to look at this. In the woodland, so where you saw the trillium and the foam flower, um, we also brought in soil, um, but not very much because that was an existing woodland. And, um, uh, and the reason why we brought in soil is because we wanted to get the plants established before the roots of the existing trees kind of took all the moisture away. So we put a very thin layer, uh, two and a half inches of soil, um, kind of spread evenly over the landscape in the wooded part of the garden and then planted a gazillion. You saw all what we did. And it's amazing. You saw how well they grew. And that was just to give those things an advantage. And eventually, you know, that's going to blend well with existing soil. So it was really plant specific. If you did you find your horrible soil alongside the road, where did you find it? Um, it, it was, again, uh, one of the great frustrations of my professional career is having to have a staff member spend countless hours kind of wrangling with soil people um, to find really bad soil and get it shipped here. <laughs> Um, basically, it's fabric, it's manufactured. It's a very long story, but um, they take sands and organic material. But our soil consultants, you know, curse him, um, uh, who we needed to sign off on the project for a variety of reasons, um, who I learned to just loathe with every fiber of my being. Um, uh, although he did actually create good soil recipes, so he did that well, at least. But he insisted that for the meadow that there be an element, so you're baking a cake, um, and that one of the ingredients be topsoil, because the argument is that topsoil has within it biota, living things, bacteria, nematodes, all the little things that make soil alive um, that have taken, in his words, hundreds or thousands of years to develop. So he's picturing this world 10,000 years. A glacier comes through, no more soil. The soil that we have around us has been built over, say, 10,000 years. Right? It's like, how could you avoid? Why wouldn't you want that life in your soil? So I said, well, A, it's hard to find topsoil that's got exactly the right specifications. And B, it's kind of a pain in the ass. And C, it's expensive. Can't we just take sand and compost and make it? We could make it so structurally and chemically is precisely what he specified. There are no actual specifications for the life in the soil. It's just a general request for life in the soil. So suffice it to say, we found a source of topsoil that miraculously, from the region, that matched exactly the specifications. And this is what I wish I'd said to him, and I will say to him next time I see him, when you want and ask for and pay for life in your soil, who's a gardener here? All right, so what do you think the most abundant life and soil is when you're a gardener? Bacteria. 
Huh? Well, no, yeah, you're right. You're, but, but what's the most obvious life in soil? Weeds. I mean, the topsoil was just like a weed factory. So that beautiful spread of wonderful great out by the next spring, you know, it's just, you couldn't see the little plugs for the weeds. So if gardeners on the hands and knees, because we're not going to spray because nothing's big enough or whatever, so no Roundup, no nothing, just pulling weeds. So um, I, I think that we could have achieved the same result with just sand and compost. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a long answer to your question, but no, you hit a nerve. That's a great answer. That's exactly what I was looking for. And another question, you mentioned the birds coming in in abundance. Uh, what happens to the birds that are not Fantastic. Um, in fact, in the forest, you saw the pictures of those scientists doing their science. Um, uh, one of the things they're studying are um, salamanders, because salamanders are kind of a keystone um, uh, species. They're indicator species. We have the healthiest populations of two-lined and eastern grayback salamanders anywhere in the metropolitan region, uh, which is quite wonderful.